Good morning, class. This is Chris Dunaway, and we are in Module 17 of the Louisiana Ag Center Home Garden Certificate course. And today we're going to be talking about legumes and growing legume, leguminous vegetables. So the legumes are in the Fabiaceae family, formerly the Leguminosiae family. The characteristics are they, uh, they have an alternating compound leaf. So remember, the compound leaf is a, a leaflet composed of multiple um, leaves on it, and, but these are going to be alternating, so they, there'll be one, then another. And at the base of that stalk, there's going to be this little stipule, this little round cup-like leaf growing at the base of that leaflet. The flowers of the legume, uh, vegetables, that is the one, the, the legumes that produce vegetables, are all papillonaceous, which means they kind of resemble butterflies. They have five petals. They have two standard petals. Um, they have two wing petals, and then they have two keel petals. So you see the keel petal makes it look kind of like a little boat with the stamens in there, all nestled in like comfortable passengers. They are nine few stamens on one single um, stamen. So basically they grow together. Uh, they fuse as they're developing. They come out and there's nine on the end, but they all are producing the pollen there. The, um, the fruit is a legume, so it's a pod, and it's a simple fruit, and it's usually dihiscus, which means it, it opens along a seam uh, on two sides. And if you... Uh, ever opened the peas or something like that, you'll know that you split that pod in two and it opens up right down the middle like a zipper. Most plants in the Fabiaceae family uh, form symbiotic relationships uh, with bacteria which live in the soil. And the nodules uh, form on those roots that fix the nitrogen. So they actually can um, make their own nitrogen out of the atmosphere uh, so they don't necessarily need it as a fertilizer like other plants do. Oop, let me, and the, uh, the way this works, uh, and this is really fascinating, is that the genus and species of the rhizobia are specific to the legume which it infects. So for every type of plant that you're going to be planting, a uh, peanut or uh, a pea, there is a certain rhizobia that's already present in the soil that can um, infect it. And if you plant the wrong plant and the wrong bacteria is there, uh, you won't necessarily get that nitrogen fixing activity. So um, it's the combination, this, uh, this symbiotic relationship that makes that work. So what happens is in step one is you plant the plant in the ground and the roots grow. And this rhizobium, this bacteria will grow one of its little filament thread-like things into the cell wall, penetrate, and then start reproducing inside of the root. And now we've dealt with root knot nematodes, and we've seen something similar to this, which is a bad thing for the plants, but this is the opposite. This is actually helping the plant. Uh, and by the plant giving it the things that the bacteria needs to survive, the bacteria is giving the plant something in return. And some of the um, common legumes that we uh, are, are used to eating are soybeans, uh, sugar snap peas, fava beans, lima beans, peanuts, lentils, chickpeas, cow peas, snap beans, and jicama. And jicama is interesting because maybe we, you don't even realize this is a, um, a legume we're eating because usually we eat that large tuber the, um, instead of the beans. Now, peanuts are really fascinating because even though they grow underground, they start off above ground. So when that flower gets pollinated, the stalk will dip down and touch the soil, and then that, that um, spike will grow the peanut into the ground. So that's where the peanut develops, even though it's not actually part of the roots. For growing, the conditions are... Um, and again, this is interesting because we have cool season legumes and warm season legumes. So we're approaching the cool season now. So we're going to be start, be start thinking about planting the cool season crops, which is um, sugar peas, snow peas, and fava beans. Now, it's very much uh, 
too hot. Actually, it's still part of the summer season, so you, you may be able to get some of these warm season crops in uh, as, at the, as a last minute crop. And you have um, peanuts and other beans. And for the cool season crops, the germination optimum temperature is 68 to 75 degrees. So that's still pretty warm. Um, but it's definitely much later in the season than, uh, like, I think October is about the time in South Louisiana you're going to plant a lot of these. And the uh, summer crops, 75 to 85 degrees. So that's got a much warmer germination temperature. So you can you can uh, germinate these in the in the warmer weather. And you do direct seed all these legumes. It's best just to plant them straight in the ground. There's no reason to transplant them into trays or anything like that. They'll do very well just straight into the soil. Growing peanuts. Now this is something that uh, we could be growing, but we aren't really growing that many peanuts. But why not? Why are we not growing very many peanuts in the garden? I mean, they're a perfectly fine plant. They do well. They are delicious and can be used for many different things. But they do need a well-drained, sandy soil, rich in organic matter. Now, they do very well in uh, raised beds. The ideal pH is between 6 and 7. And remember, you'll get your pH um, tested from the soil lab, it's the best way to find that. They do need a lot of sunlight. They want eight hours of minimum of direct sunlight. So um, not planted under a tree, uh, not planted where they're gonna be getting shade. They wanna get that good, good warm sun. You can, of course, soil test to get your uh, soil fertility. Uh, if you do not do that, the general growing instructions are put uh, one and a half cups of triple eight fertilizer per 100 square feet at planting. And then you want to side dress with a cup of gypsum, um, which is calcium sulfate, at flowering. So the peanuts need the calcium for good pod development. Growing other legumes, um, it's pretty much the same. They like a little bit different pH, but they still like that well-drained um, organic soil. They want a loam soil, so maybe not so much sandy soil. Ideal pH is a little lower, between 5.8 and 6.8. Again, minimum eight hours sun per day. These things are making offspring. Like I said before, they need that energy for good development. And you can do, again, the soil test recommendations is the best way to go. I keep saying this again, we've already got a lot of nutrients in the soil. There's really no reason to put a lot of uh, phosphorus and potassium if it's already there. Uh, if you don't get a soil test, then the general rule, uh, general recommendations would be one pound of 8, 24, 24. So definitely got a lot more phosphorus and potassium in there per 100 square feet at plant. Uh, excuse me, 100 square feet at planting. Um, some there are pole and bush varieties, so you always want to stake the, the pole varieties because they will definitely grow on the ground and spread out and. Uh, fungus and disease and, and bad things, you definitely will not get very much of harvest. And there is a rhizomium inoculum that is available that can increase the plant health and yields. So we've already covered how the, um, that rhizobial activity can increase the, the reach of the roots by bringing in nutrients and water. Well, this, there's a product, uh, products available that you treat your seeds with before you even plant them and inoculate them with that rhizome so that when they start growing, they've already got it there. <clears throat> Plant spacing, again, of course, is important when we're gro growing our vegetables. It's, uh, you know, we, uh, one a common mistake that uh, early gardeners make is planting things too close together. So we want to pay attention to that. And then we want to know how long to expect that um, before we can harvest. So for snap beans, the spacing is about um, between 3 and 12 inches. Some of that depends on if it's a bush variety or a pole variety, because the, um, the, uh, the, the bush varieties tend to take a little bit more footprint. It's about 48 to 66 days to harvest, and it's a warm season. Lima beans, other beans, uh, it's 4 to 12 inches and 60 to 90 days. It's a warm season crop as well. Soybeans are pretty close together, four to six inches, um, 75 to 85 days, and it's a warm season as well. Sugar snap, bee, uh, sugar snap peas or snow peas 
are very close. Uh, spacing, two to three inches, pretty short days to harvest, 60 to 70. It's a cool season crop. The cow peas and field peas, again, close together, 70 to 80 days. It's a warm season. Peanuts, four to eight inches. They do have a very long uh, development period, 110 to 120 days. So, you know, be prepared to give it some time. They are a warm season crop, uh, but, you know, I love peanuts. They're so worth it. Fava beans, close together, 75 to 80, and they're a cool season. And then just like, uh, again, when we're looking at uh, when is it going to be ready? When is it the most uh, perfect time to pick these things? It kind of depends on what you're going to be doing with them. If you've got snap beans, the, uh, the pod should be smooth, tender, and green. So they, uh, you don't want to wait too long. You don't want them to change color, get, start getting dark. You don't want them to get uh, too hard. You're going to be eating, that, uh, eating the whole thing. So you want to be able to um, want that uh, outside to be smooth. Lima beans, you can, uh, if you're going to eat, be eating them fresh, you want the pods to be plump and the seeds are bulging. But if you want to uh, save them and, and dry them, you're actually going to wait till the pods are dry and easy to open. Now, you have to be careful with this and keep your eye on the garden. You want to go out there and kind of test these things because there's a perfect time. You want to, the, you want that moisture to be gone because they'll, they'll uh, store better. If you have too much moisture in there, the, the, your beans will rot. But if you wait too long, that bean's going to pop open and, and the, uh, the seeds are going to come out. So you've got to check it every day and don't wait too long. Same thing with the soybeans and other beans. So the soybeans, you want them to be fresh. <clears throat> Just as the pods begin to lose their color. So you, you do want them to go pretty good into maturity but you still want them to be green. Um, if you're going to save them for dry, you want, to wait, you want the pods to be dry, and the plant has lost about 90% of its leaves. So that's a pretty long period. The sugar and snow peas, the snow peas, you want them to be flat. You want the pods to be flat when there's little to no seed bulge. So you're actually really just going for the uh, outside of that, that um, that being, you're not actually going for the seeds at all. You really want it to be as tender as, and sweet as can be. <clears throat> Sugar snap beans, you want them, the pods are still green, but they are plump, and the seeds are just starting to swell. So again, you're going for a very immature uh, seed inside. And, but if you want the fresh peas, if you're actually going to uh, hold them and, and take out the, the peas inside, you want the pods to be fully formed, and the, the uh, pod wall is beginning to change color and thins. So it's later in the season, but you really want those nice, uh, um, the, the peas to be in, inside and develop. The cow peas and field peas, for fresh, you want them, the pods are fully formed and the seeds are bulging. So these are, are ready to go, fully, open, fully formed, <clears throat> but still nice and soft. Uh, when they're dry, you want the, again, the, the pods to be dry. You basically touch them, and they will pop open in your hands really easily. Fava beans, for fresh, you want the pods are green and the seeds are plump. So these are, are pretty, felt, pretty well developed, but still fresh and, and green. And then, again, if you want to dry them, wait till they're all fully dry. And peanuts, you actually dig them out of the ground generally when the older leaves begin to turn yellow. So you just have to keep an eye on this plant. Uh, everything's going on underground that matters, so it's hard to keep an eye on it. But as you start to see those yellow leaves, you can, you can dig, do a little test digging and, and see what's down there. When you see your peanuts the size you want, go ahead and dig them all up. And now we're going to go over some common pests of our legumes. So I uh, hope you enjoy this and learn a lot from this next segment. Hey class, we're going to talk real quick about some common insect pests that you might see on your legumes. Now we've covered a lot of these in some of our earlier modules, so we'll fly through them a little bit fast today. First off, you've seen these before, aphids. Now there are some that specifically tend to go after legumes, and that black bean aphid is a good case and point for that. You can see they're black in coloration. Um, we've seen different colored aphids in some of the other modules. 
This one really does like to host on our beans. Um, army worms, that's a very common garden pest as well, um, especially during the hotter months. They will go after your legumes, and remember, we treat those with BT or spinosad or any of your caterpillar control products. Uh, corn earworm, very similar as well. Stink bugs, they will go after our legumes, and they do like to chew the edges. They can create some stippling as well. Um, rips that will go after our beans as well. And you can see the damage over here on the far right center photo where those thrips have sort of removed the top layer of cell on the leaves, and that's the thrip damage. Um, two spotted spider mites. We have our mite damage in the upper center photograph. And a lot of times people will email us photos of this damage and say, what's this rust on my beans or my peas? And that's typically a, a mite damage. They create that stippling pattern. So it's not actually a rust or a fungal issue, it's actually an insect or an arachnid issue. Um, white flies will actually go after a lot of legumes as well. Um, and remember, when our white flies are present, you can kind of wave your hands over those plants and they fly up in clouds. So very hard to control because they move a lot. Um, but remember, we did cover some of that in earlier modules and what to do if you do have them. Spider mites are a very common problem in hot weather. And remember, you'll see that webbing and if you look very, very closely, the mites themselves. So it might not be a spider web or a harmless spider web on your plants if you see that webbing in combo with some of this stipple damage as well. So check for spider mites if you see that. The Mexican bean beetle is one that really goes after a lot of legumes here in the New Orleans area. I actually got a call about this the other day. Um, the adults are oval. They're actually quite large, about a quarter inch long. And a lot of folks think they're ladybugs, actually, but they're not. Um, they are sort of an orangey brown with eight spots on each wing cover. And everyone's always like, oh, look at the beautiful ladybug. Well, nope, these guys are bad news in a garden if you're trying to grow things like beans or cow peas, especially in the summer months. Um, they do feed on the leaves, the flowers, and the pods. And they create this almost lacy pattern of damage, especially on the leaves. So if you go out there, and this can happen overnight, you go out there and you see that your leaves have turned to lace, start checking for beetles as well. And this is a really good picture of what the eggs and the nymphs look like, um, the different instars of that bean beetle. And then actually on the pods, that lower photo all the way to the right, you'll see where it looks like chunks of it are missing. That's the beetle feeding. So if you see that, check for these critters. You can control them with natural predators. Um, Dr. Joe has listed some here as well, and then there's some insecticides that work on them. Beetles are generally a little hard to control in a home garden setting. Typically what I do is just pick them off when I see them and stomp them. Um, it sounds harsh, but it works really well. And especially if you're an organic gardener, really go for those natural predators or manual removal. And picking things off is manual removal in your integrated pest management, don't forget. <laughs> Some other ones, the bean beetle, bean leaf beetle. Um, again, people can confuse these for ladybugs, um, but they're not ladybugs. They do a lot of damage. They come in many different colors and colorations and patterns. And I've mostly seen the sort of reddish or the tan with the four spotted ones here in the New Orleans area, but there is a lot of variation. Uh, the larva is almost like a little grub. That's that lower right-hand corner image. Um, you know, that's actually a beetle larva. The larva will actually feed on the roots and the adults feed on the canopy of the plant. So it's a one-two punch similar to some of the other insect pests that we've seen in earlier modules where you see the damage up top, but then you might not know what's going on below the soil surface with these larva feeding on the roots. So if you see a lot of wilting or collapse of your bean or legume plants, you might want to pull a couple off and see if you can find some, some of these guys. Control of these bean leaf beetles can come from insecticidal soap, neem oil, that's a good one a lot of folks reach for, spinosad, pyrethrin, and biurethrin. This next one is actually shown up at my house recently, and that's the cowpea curculio. And this is a little weevil-like insect, actually. They're about a quarter inch long. They're black, and they have an, a long mouth part. So it's like a big, long snout. And that's how you can recognize them very easily. And the larvae are these pale level maggots that feed on your cow peas as well. Um, they feed on the seeds inside the pods, but also the leaves. The adults are usually visible on the leaves. 
the larva. I've seen them inside the pods, especially as I'm trying to shell my cow peas. Very annoying. Um, but these guys do pop up in the summer. Be aware of them, especially if you're growing anything like purple hull peas, cow peas, crowder peas, um, which a lot of folks do in southern gardens. Keep an eye out for them. And you can get parasitic flies and wasps that provide some natural control for these guys. Um, you can get some different fungi that will attack them specifically. Neem is a good one. And again, we've got some insecticide options as well. The lesser cornstalk borer, again, that's a moth, actually. You can see the male and female on the far right-hand corner photos. Um, they will actually get into the stalk of the bean or the legume and kind of hollow it out as they feed. Um, I have seen this in our area as well. The adult moths are three quarters of an inch long. Again, they're what we would call a boring brown moth. Remember, if we see that in our gardens, chances are pretty good at the pest species. Something to keep in mind. And then the actual larva are bluish green with yellowish stripes. Um, and they're very distinctive. They've got kind of a banded pattern to them. The damage, um, they do feed on the roots and they tunnel into the stems as we had discussed. Um, they can girdle the stems so that, you know, water and nutrients are unable to flow through the vascular tissue as they're um, getting in there. And you see how this plant on the far left has wilted and there should be ample water in that field or that environment. That's a good clue that there might be something feeding on the inside of that plant. So it's always a good idea to scout our gardens pretty frequently and check for little critters like this. If everything else seems like it's fine, you've watered, you've fertilized, you've spaced your plants correctly, you're keeping up with your disease control, you might have an insect problem. So don't forget. <laughs> and we have several control options for these as well. Remember, they're a soft-bodied um, caterpillar that's feeding, so a lot of our caterpillar controls will work on them. The tarnished plant bug. We do get a lot of calls about this one, especially end of July into August. Um, it is a true bug. The adults are about a quarter inch long, and they're actually quite colorful and beautiful to look at. Um, again, bad pests, though, so you don't want to keep them around. The nymphs are actually very small and green. They can get confused at times for a large aphid. I've seen folks do that, so just keep in mind if they're, if they're that big, they're probably not an aphid. Uh, they transmit diseases. That's the big problem here. They vector as they're feeding. They'll move diseases from one plant to the other. Um, they can have terminal growth, yellow or distorted leaves. Um, you can see the feeding damage here on the bottom uh, set of photos as well. And sometimes the flowers where they've fed on the bud fail to develop and open properly. They get kind of distorted um, and then they fail to pollinate, fail to create a pod or anything edible on our plants. Um, these do overwinter and live in the environment in weeds, so it's important to keep the area sanitary around your garden by weeding on a regular basis, maybe mowing along your fences or the edges of your plot, um, because that's where those are living the rest of the year when you don't have your crop in the ground. Um, it's providing a habitat for them. There are some parasitic beneficials, and you can use carbaryl. There's a few different options um, that work on the tarnished plant bugs, but the main, main way to control them is good sanitation in your garden, keeping debris removed, keeping any um, dead or diseased plants out, and then keeping your weeds down. That's really the best method of control, and we should be doing that anyway. The banded cucumber beetle. We did talk about this one, or we're about to, with the cucurbit section. Um, it's actually a very beautiful insect. <laughs> People really like this one, but it can do a lot of damage in our gardens, and it goes for a lot of different garden plants, including our legumes. They're typically maybe about five to six millimeters long. They're very small. They're shiny, um, very noticeable in the garden, usually on top of the plants. They're in the top part. Um, they do have a larva that's that yellowish kind of white larva there on the bottom, and they can have a uh, yellowy color to them as well. That's kind of how you can tell them apart. The larva will only feed on the roots. So unless you're pulling up your plants and looking for them and slitting those roots open, you probably won't see them. Um, but a lot of folks do notice the adults when they're in the garden. They're very active, especially during daylight hours. Uh, the adults will feed on all plant parts and they can cause defoliation if there's a large enough population of adults feeding in the canopy. Uh, they can vector a lot of our bean diseases, our legume-specific diseases, like cowpea mosaic virus, um, a different, couple different model virus, and um, 
mosaic viruses as well. So they can move a lot of things around through the environment. And remember that there are native legumes in the environment that might have disease. So if they fed on those and then come into your garden, they can vector those things. So it's important to keep these under control if you do see them. You can purchase parasitic nematodes online to help control where you water those in or spray those in the area. Um, and they'll actually go after the larva in the soil and hunt them. So that's a good natural organic control. Neem, pyrethrins, you have a few different um, you know, harsher chemical options as well to control the adults. So you can do kind of a two-sided approach if you do have an outbreak of these in your garden where you're controlling what's in the ground with the nematodes, with the larva, and then you control the adult population up top. And with that, Joe's going to come jump in and talk about some of our more common diseases of legumes, including some vectored by insect pests. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Chris. Now what I'm going to do is talk to you about some of the common diseases that we have with legume crops. And I hope what you're beginning to see is that amongst our vegetables, there's a lot of diseases and insects that kind of cross over the lines. They, uh, there are diseases that are very similar on the multiple different types of crops from different families. There are insects that feed on different types of uh, the crops from different families. So you're going to begin to see patterns and things that you probably will start to recognize, we hope. Uh, but remember, back with the disease triangle presentation we gave you, you don't always have to break the cycle with the pathogen. You can also do things in the environment that make the environment less conducive for disease development. You can even do things with the host to make it less susceptible. So keep that in mind as we present control measures. Uh, remember, there are, are lots of things that you can do uh, to try to control these different diseases. And hopefully you'll begin to see those patterns develop over time. Uh, but one of the common bean diseases uh, are, is the bacterial brown spot. I'm sure even if you get your beans in a grocery store, a lot of us have seen uh, bean pods that look like the ones there on the upper right. And those have the bacterial uh, brown spot. Uh, the bacterium overwinters on host weeds and plant debris. So when you see that, you automatically think, oh, well, one good way of trying to control it would be to get rid of all the plant debris and get rid of any weeds that are around in my garden. So those sanitation uh, measures that we mention often, if those are followed pretty well, you're going to have a lot fewer insect and disease problems. So just keep that in mind. Having a good looking clean garden is also a healthier garden. Um, with the bacterial brown spot, of course, you have brown necrotic spots on your pods and on your leaves, as you can see in the pictures there. And with a lot of the plant diseases, we're going to mention it in the control measures. This is one of the cultural practices is uh, in almost all cases, overhead watering is not a good idea. So avoid overhead watering and irrigation as much as possible whenever you're irrigating your garden. Of course, you can't stop the rain, but uh, you can keep from doing it artificially because a lot of the diseases develop on wet leaves and a lot of the pathogens are transferred from one plant to another or from the soil up onto the host plant by splattering of water during irrigation or rain. So if you avoid overhead watering, you're going to uh, help to save yourself some problems with the insects and diseases, primarily with the diseases. There are resistant varieties to bacterial brown spots, so check your seed catalogs when you're ordering your seed and when you're looking for varieties to choose, and if you think you I might have a problem, or if you just want to avoid the problem of bacterial brown spot, get a variety that has resistance already to bacterial brown spot. Uh, another one is common blight. This is another bacterial disease. There are several bacterial diseases that our legumes get, and this is a second one. You'll have, as you see on the leaf there, you get water-soaked lesions, and they have, they're very irregular. They aren't usually round. Uh, they have irregular edges, and they will develop uh, necrosis with a chlorotic halo around them, and all the above ground parts of the legumes uh, can be infected by the xanthomonas, which causes common blight. And it is a seed transmitted disease, so one control measure is to use certified disease free seed. And with that in mind, uh, in almost all cases, if you get your seed from a reputable dealer who is a local um, garden center or something like that, or a uh, reputable 
a seed catalog company, they do a good job of testing their plants for any seed borne diseases. So most always you will get really good quality seed from the reputable dealers. Sanitation is another way uh, because the bacterium can uh, survive on soil, on plant debris. Uh, crop rotation, uh, which as we know, most bacteria die pretty quickly without a host. So if you have a problem and it's in the soil, if you do a crop rotation with a non-susceptible host, a lot of times you can get rid of some of the soil problems because if it's bacterial especially, they'll die off. And the third bacterial disease that we're going to mention is the halo blight. This is caused by a Pseudomonas syringae bacterium. And this one can survive for up to a year in plant debris. So you see that, you think, okay, don't leave my plant debris in the garden because that's just going to be a breeding ground for disease and insects. It's always a good idea to remove uh, the plant debris. Get rid of it. Keep your garden clean. And with the halo blight, you will have, as you can see on the leaf, and with the, on the bean pods, um, they have you know, angular water-soaked lesions and they will almost always have that halo around them. A halo, a necrotic halo, um, or a chlorotic halo that surrounds the lesion. Um, hence the name halo blight. Uh, once again, it's seed transmissible, so using certified disease-free seed, uh, good sanitation, uh, practices and avoid overhead watering. You don't want to be spreading it from one plant to another if one plant happens to get it and the rest of them are healthy. And then uh, anthracnose, you've seen that before on some of our other crops. Uh, anthracnose on the legumes, it is colitotricum, but uh, you can see they're very similar. The, the lesions are very similar as you'll see them on most uh, crops whenever uh, Anthracnose is the disease. You'll have you know, the dark necrotic lesions. They'll usually develop some um, concentric circles in them. And uh, you can see it, it does affect the pods and the leaves. Essentially all above ground surfaces of the plant can be infected by the Colitotrichum and cause anthracnose. The lesions on the pods and on the leaves usually are uh, sunken lesions. And, it can, and this is a fungal disease that can be seed borne. So once again, use certified seed uh, to avoid get, bringing it in on the seed. Sanitation, there are some uh, fungicides that you can use. And this particular fungus can survive up to two years on crop debris in the soil. So once again, stay clean. Start clean, stay clean. You can avoid a lot of problems. Uh, bean rust, this one is pretty common. Uh, you see this one a lot uh, on especially uh, snap beans and green beans, things like that. Uh, I, I see this one quite often. Uh, it can survive in the soil on plant debris. So once again, staying clean. And this particular fungus, it can even survive on the poles that you use uh, to uh, trellis your pole beans. So if you have a rust problem in your bean garden and growing area, you also want to either sanitize your stakes that you're using for the pole beans to climb on or replace them with others if you uh, have that problem. That's just a way of avoiding and having inoculum show up. And of course with rust, you got the name, you're going to see the color. The rusty color spores that are produced. And so you want to remove the plant debris as we said it survives and then there are some uh, like chlorothalonil sulfur, some fungicides that are effective against rust. And once again, avoid that overhead watering. You just don't want that to happen. Now, alternaria uh, leaf spot. You've seen alternaria come up before on other crops. Uh, you're going to have similar symptoms on legumes as you do on other crops as far as the way that the lesions look. They're going to be uh, brown lesions. They're regular lesions. They have the concentric zones in them. Uh, sometimes the older lesions will drop out and give you a shot hole effect. Uh, they'll co coalesce and completely cover the leaves. Uh, once the conditions are right for this disease to develop, it can develop very fast. So if you have plants that you see it uh, starting to develop on those, go ahead and either get rid of the plant parts if it's just a few leaves are infected or get rid of the entire plants. By getting rid of those plants, you're reducing the inoculum level and it may uh, help keep some of the other plants healthier. Uh, if you keep the plants very healthy, 
as far as nutrients that you provide for them. A lot of times the plants can resist some of these diseases or at least tolerate them and not be severely affected. And there are a few fungicides that you can try. Um, now this is one that you're going to see often uh, in a lot of our crops and our veggie crops uh, is any disease that might be called white mold, it can be called southern blight, different things like that. But if you have sclerotinia in there as the genus of the fungus, then that is a really tough fungus. There's sclerotinia rossii, sclerotinia sclerotium, sclerotinia sclerotiorum. All of the sclerotinia fungi produce uh, sclerotia, which are the small, black, hard survival units that they produce. And in most cases, the sclerotinia, depending on which species it is, they can survive anywhere from five to 20 years in the soil. And there are no really no fungicides that are labeled for use on uh, our vegetables for the different uh, sclerotinia that may show up. Most of the time you can uh, see the white fungus growing uh, a lot of times, especially at the base of the plant uh, where the soil line is because it is a, a soil borne fungus. Um, it can also be transmitted through the seed. Uh, so you, um, at least one way you can try to control it is use the you know, certified disease-free seed. And a lot of times if our plants are really lush beyond the point of health and set in the fact that we got too much nitrogen, um, they become a little more susceptible to the different sclerotinia. Uh, so um, keep that in mind. Um, if you have a sclerotinia problem, then it's going to be in the soil and stay in the soil. So the best way to prevent the sclerotinia from becoming a real problem is to try to keep it out as much as possible. Uh, if you have uh, diseased plants, get them out as soon as you recognize that you have diseased plants uh, because you don't want them to start producing those sclerotia. A fusarium foot rot is another one. You're going to see fusarium show up a lot of times uh, in the different veggies that we grow. Uh, fusarium solani, of course it has solani, that means it's probably first found on the solanaceous crops. So fusarium foot rot that causes the legume disease is also the one that affects the tomatoes, the peppers, the potatoes, uh, eggplants, our solanaceous crops, they're also in, can be infected with the solanate, I mean with the fusarium solani. Uh, it can survive in the soil for several years. So uh, keep that in mind that if you have a problem one year, then it's probably going to be in the soil and you need to start thinking about uh, ways to uh, control it. So one way is try crop rotation. Uh, but as you can see with some uh, fungi like solani, there are several different families that this fungus can infect. So check it out if you're going to do a crop rotation. Make sure that the disease you're trying to control doesn't infect whatever other family of plants you're going to put in there. Uh, as you can see uh, with the different pictures that we have here, one thing that you'll, you're probably coming to uh, recognize is that if you open, split open a stem on a plant down in, especially down in the root area or anything, it should be very nice and white or very light green. If you open up the stem of a plant and if there's any discoloration, brown discoloration, black discoloration, anything like that, then you've got a diseased plant. There are very few plants that have a natural dark color in their vascular tissue. So once you split that open, if you see that dark discoloration, then you know you've got an infection. It can be bacterial, it can be fungal, but you definitely got a disease uh, once you see that uh, dark discoloration on the interior of the stem. So that's one uh, good way of recognizing that you have a problem. And, and as you can see with this one, the d dark discoloration starts down here at the base and, we're, and then it actually gets a little bit lighter as you go higher. That's an indication of where the darkest area is is probably where the infection took place. And then it's kind of spreading up the plant. So this one, of course, the infection takes place in the root system because it's a soil-borne pathogen. And then it's spreading up the plant. Uh, damping off uh, is a common problem with legumes. It's a problem with a lot of our vegetables, but legumes uh, sometimes uh, I think tend to be a little more susceptible to damping off than some of our other 
uh, crops that we grow. And it's essentially damping off is the seedlings are infected right at the soil line. Uh, it's usually when they're young. And the pathogen will girdle the stem and the seeding will fall over and simply just drop over. And that's uh, damping off. If you see that happening in your seedling trays, or when you're growing seedlings or even in the field, a lot of times it's damping off. And that can be caused by several different fungi. There's rhizotonia, there's fusarium, there's pythium. Uh, different fungi can cause this same disease. So uh, that damping off disease. Now it can infect plants as they get older and Usually it takes a little longer for the disease to become apparent, but as you can see in that field picture we have there, uh, those uh, plants were infected with one of these fungi that causes damping off. It eventually does girdle the plant and they will just wilt and sometimes fall over in the field. One good way to prevent uh, this disease is to uh, pre-treat the seed with a fungicide before you plant it. Uh, a lot of seeds, when you order them, uh, from different seed companies, sometimes they will tell you that this particular seed has been treated with a fungicide. Um, in beans, they usually treat with thyram, uh, which gives the beans a kind of a, a pink color on the outside. And this is a way of preventing these soil-borne diseases by pre-treating the seed with the fungicide. And um, usually varieties of plants that are very, very susceptible to uh, damping off will be pre-treated. So that's one good way of controlling uh, this disease is just never let it attack. You protect the seedling from the very beginning so it doesn't have a chance to infect. And then of course there are the viruses. There are quite a few different viruses that legumes can get. Uh, there's the common mosaic, the mosaic necrosis virus. Um, those two will cause the, you know, the mosaic pattern, which we talked to you about before, the light, dark, light, dark, mosaic. Um, those two different ones are aphid transmitted, as is the bean yellow mosaic virus. Uh, the bean yellow mosaic virus, as you can see in the top right there, it gives a bright yellow color to uh, the leaves. Uh, a lot of times you'll have distortion with the different mosaic viruses as well. Uh, beet curly top virus, now this one's leaf hopper uh, vectored. So, uh, still insect vector, but it's a different insect that's doing it. And with this one, you'll get, uh, the plants will be stunted. And the curly top, why would they call it curly top virus? Because it causes the tops of the plants to get all misshapen and, and take on this appearance like here, the way, you know, you say it's kind of curled. The leaves are curled. The top may be twisted somewhat. And this is a being infected with beet curly top virus. And you can see it also causes the chlorosis. And the best way to control virus diseases uh, are to find resistant varieties and also to keep the weeds out of your garden because a lot of times the viruses and the vectors will live on and live in and feed on wild weeds that are of the same family of the vegetables that you're growing. And so your plants may be perfectly healthy, but the weed that grows up in the garden has the virus and the vector feeds on it and then moves over to your garden plants and transmits the virus. So it's always a good idea to keep the weeds down. They're competition for your plant. They can provide a habitat for different diseases and insects. So keeping the garden clean is a really good way. Now with this, these particular viruses, uh, most of the ones I mentioned here, trying to control the vector is not a, an effective means of controlling the disease because the virus is transmitted so rapidly that as soon as the insect uh, sticks its little proboscis into the plant and starts to feed, it will transmit the virus. So uh, anything you do to try to control those vectors is not going to really be effective against these different viruses. Now even though we told you that there's some problems that you encounter still, using uh, the different techniques that we talked to you about, you can get a beautiful harvest from your garden of legumes. and so. Our mantra of start clean, stay clean, good sanitation, uh, using disease-free seed, disease-free uh, plants, having soil with good drainage, keeping the plants healthy through fertilization, and all those cultural practices, that will go a long way in helping you to have a 
healthy garden that doesn't really have that many disease and insect problems. And this can be your table. Okay, thanks. We're going to move on into uh, other different families of vegetables, but I hope you enjoyed this one on legumes.